Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Digital Signatures. My name is Karin Pipe, and I'm working the marketing team here at ITEX, and I'm excited to be your host of today's webinar. I'm pleased to introduce Michael DeMay to you. He's going to uh, speak to you today. Uh, he's our research engineer and also our digital signatures enthusiast. And he's going to show you how digital signing works in PDFs and how ITEX technology enables digital signing. Oh. For some reason, my slides seems we have it. Okay. Um, before I hand over the mic to Michael, just a few practical items. Um, today's webinar will be available on demand. Everyone will receive an email um, after the webinar with a link to the recording, and you'll also be able to access it from our website, itextpdf.com, as well as our YouTube channel. Um, if you have questions for, for Michael during the webinar, feel free to send them through the questions tab in the GoToWebinar panel. Um, we'll be answering questions at the end uh, of the webinar. And if you don't get to your question because of lack of time, then um, we can guarantee that we will get back to you afterwards. Um, now, ITEX has always been at the forefront of digital signatures in PDF by supporting PADES and by being one of the first to support signatures in the latest PDF 2.0 release. Our mature and easy to use API has been thoroughly tested by the industry and has proven to be a success as it's been used throughout several use cases such as company signatures, desktop applications, integrations into document management systems and more. Michael will now present to you how digital signing works in PDFs and he will introduce a variety of use cases in different types of industries. Michael, the floor is yours. Let me change this. Yeah. You should be able to present now. Good. Okay, thank you, Karin, for that introduction. Um, so, hi, everyone. Before we enter into digital signatures, I'm more than happy to introduce ITEX to you. ITEX is an international software company that is specialized in AGPL and commercial software, more specifically, PDF libraries and solutions. We're headquartered in Belgium, but we have offices in the US and South Korea and Singapore. Our products and solutions are used for various purposes, invoices, credit card statements, boarding passes, patient documentation, certificates, regular PDF documents, and many more. So um, with that overview out of the way, let's dive into signatures. Before we get into the technical know-how of how PDF works with signatures, let's first define what the signature tries to achieve. Um, there's a few goals that we need to explain and a few concepts, technical concepts that we need to know before we can start about uh, talking about introducing them into PDF. So one of the first goals that we try to achieve with PDF signatures are um, is integrity. So I've put here a screenshot or at least a picture of a newspaper clipping. And um, this guy, Eddie, he was renovating his house and Every month or bi-monthly, he would get a, a bill, an invoice from his contractor. And being the good man that he is, he paid it without checking it. Um, but one of his invoices was a forge invoice. Um, the bank account number was changed on the statement. And Eddie just took um, the, um, the statement and went to his bank. And he lost 30,000 euros, um, all because he had no way of checking whether or not the document was forged. Um, and that's what integrity is all about. You want to make sure that your document has not been changed from its inception or from when it's been signed. And you need a way to do that. And Eddie, unfortunately, did not have such a way. The second concept that we want to uh, get, at least the goal that we want to get, is authenticity. Um, back in the day, Emperor Constantine I was um, being depicted on murals and tapestries all over Europe as having transferred his authority to the Pope. Um, this was a widely believed um, historian, history fact, um, but that was never really true. Um, not until recently it was found out that the letter sent by Constantine to the Pope was actually a forgery as well. Um, and because Constant, uh, the Pope had no way of checking whether or not Constantine 
actually transferred his authority, um, it was assumed to be so. So we want to make sure that the author is who we think he is, that, that the Pope had a way of checking whether or not the author of the letter of, of the transfer of power was actually the emperor itself, himself instead of somebody else. The third goal that we want to achieve is non-repudiation. Um, in this picture here, you can see Bart Simpson. He drew his name in, in wet um, concrete, and he says that he didn't do it. Um, clearly, he did do it, but he's trying to deny his authorship. Um, and that's what non-repudiation is all about. We want to make sure that authors cannot deny having signed a document. Um, for instance, if I have a legally binding contract with somebody, and at the end of a certain period of time, I have to pay them 25K, um, they want to have the guarantee that I cannot deny having signed the document ever. So, and that's what we try to do with non-repudiation. And we have a few tools to our disposal to try and achieve those goals. And that's what we're going to discuss in the next few, in the next section. So before we do that, a small recap. So we have integrity, making sure the document has not been changed either by malicious intent or by corruption in the download. We have authenticity that we want to know who the author is and that we can be sure that he is who we think he is. And non-repudiation, that we want to make sure that, he, that, the, that the author of the signature cannot deny his authorship, that he cannot refute having ever signed the document. So, <clears throat> excuse me, going into the basic concepts, um, these are a few technical mathematical um, concepts that we try to, uh, that I'll try to explain to you. And these will be used to try and achieve those three goals, which we'll explain later how we will combine these concepts. So the first concept that I want to introduce to you is hashing. Hashing out is a mathematical cryptographic function in which you can turn any kind of input into a fixed size output. Um, meaning that if you input um, a file of one kilobytes, it will output the same length the same size of output as a file of 10 gigabytes, for instance. Um, important to know is that the hashing algorithm should be deterministic. That means that every time you run the function, the output should be the same, um, regardless of the time that you run it, um, the system, the environment that you run it on. Um, every time you run the same algorithm on the same input data, it should have the same output data. Another interesting a fact about these algorithms is that even a, ver a small variation in the input, like if you have an input string of A, B, C, and if you change that to A, B, D, um, the way that these algorithms are de designed, the output should be completely different. So it's, it should be hard to, to find neighboring collisions. Um, you should not be able to deduce the input based on the output. Um, there are a few available algorithms. Um, some of you might have already been, been in contact with a few of those of these, like MD5 is a very well-known one. It's also a very old one. It's been deprecated. It's been cracked since um, it feels like the dawn of time. Um, and then SHA is the, the more well-known one, the more recent one. Um, SHA1 has also been cracked recently. Um, I, I want to say 2017, but uh, my memory is a bit hazy. Uh, but SHA-2 is the, the bigger family um, and the more recent used uh, family um, of SHA algorithms, amongst which SHA-256 and 512, um, which some of you might know already. So how can we apply this concept to the one of the goals that we discussed earlier? So um, as mentioned, the algorithms, the hashing algorithms are deterministic. So take a document that is being um, offered on the server. If you want to make sure that this document has not been altered or corrupted during the download, what you can do is you can download the document. And if the server provides you with a hash, you can generate the hash on your local machine as well. So assuming that the server give, gave you an MD5 hash, what you will do is on your own machine, you will pull an MD5 hash from the document and you will compare that against the hash that the server provides you. If they are the same, then the document has not been changed and you can assume and trust the, the file that you download. And that's how we will make sure the integrity of the document is still the same. The second one has to deal with public and private key pairs. Um, they are a pair, so you have a public and a private key and a single pair. 
Um, in Belgium, where I'm from, every citizen has at least two pairs. Um, we are issued a digital ID card by the government, and on that card, there is a chip. Um, it used to be so that this chip contained two private key pairs. Um, I haven't read up on the latest standard, but I think it's still the same. Um, then their use is already described in their name. So there's a public key and a private key. The private key is your key and should not be distributed to anyone ever. Um, if that happens, then your key has been compromised, to use a, a technical term. Um, and the public key, you can distribute that to whoever you want. Um, just put it online somewhere, people will find it. These two keys are linked to each other using um, mathematical magic. Um, what one key can encrypt, the other can decrypt. Um, you cannot decrypt this. The, if you encrypt something with a public key, you cannot decrypt it with the, pub, the same public key. You need its, um, its linked private key. So from this, we can derive two concepts. So we have encryption. Let's say I want to send a private message to Karim. So what I will do is I will take Karin's public key and I will encrypt my message. That will give me a locked message indicated by the um, locked um, paper on the top half of the image here. And only her private key can open this. No other private key, no other public key can decrypt this message, meaning that I can send messages that are for Karin's eyes only. Um, if we reverse the process, we can um, deduce authorship from this. Let's say I want to send out a message and I want to make sure that everybody knows that the message came from me. Then I will use my private key to digitally sign it and that will give us a locked message as well. This message can then be decrypted or validated by my corresponding public key. Because you can decrypt it or validate it with my public key, you know that my private key encrypted the message, um, meaning that only I could have sent out that message. Um, and that's two ways that we will use um, public and private keys to deduce authorship. Um, but before we do so, we still need to introduce a third concept of certificate authorities. Um, it's quite easy to make your own keys. Everybody can Google um, a tutorial online and then find out how to uh, use self-signed certificates to, to create um, to create their own self-signed keys. Um, what we introduced here is a third party, a certificate authority. It's a trusted party um, that just hands out keys to their customers. Um, our government, the Belgian government, is a trusted party. They are a certificate authority. Another example is Global Sign. They, that's a company and you can buy private public key pairs from them. Um, and what will happen here is if you find a signed document with my public key, then you can go and ask the certificate authority, is this key valid and does it really belong to Michael? And they will say yes or they will say no. And then depending from that, you will trust the document or you won't. Um, so these are organized hierarchically in a tree-like structure. Um, Adobe is ACA, for instance. Um, every time a document is signed and opened in Adobe Reader or Acrobat, and your key is part of the tree here, then your document is automatically trusted because it's part of this structure here. Um, and that gives you the green check mark in the um, user interface from Adobe. So um, if we want to combine these concepts, so assuming that I'm the producer, I create a PDF document, then I will provide the data as is. I will give this data uh, in the form of a PDF file. I will also hash that data, the PDF file, using a hashing algorithm, and I will encrypt that using my private key. I will also embed my public key, and these three is what I will deliver to the consumer. The consumer will then take the document, it will cre create a hash using the same hashing algorithm, and it will decrypt my encrypted hash using my public key that I provided. Um, and so the consumer has two hashes. If they are the same hash, then the document has not been changed and the integrity has been warranted. Um, now, if my key was provided by a certificate authority, then you would be able to go to the certificate authority and then just ask whether or not I am who I claim to be. And there we have proven the authenticity and the non-repudiation is also included. 
So are the goals met? Sure. So um, the document still has its, its integrity, um, meaning the hashes are identical. Uh, authenticity is also proven because my identity is stored in my public key, which the CA provides, and you can always validate that against the CA. And non-repudiation has also been uh, proven because my public key can decrypt the hash, meaning that only my private key can was the one that, that uh, encrypted it. And because it was provided by the CA, my identity is also linked to my private key. So now that we've um, met our three goals, let's see how PDF does it. So um, this is an abstract view of a PDF file. Uh, the blue parts are what are the document and the pink or reddish part is um, the signature itself. So um, as you can see, everything but the signature is included in the so-called byte range. This byte range is what is um, going to be the document hash. Everything in blue is going to be hashed in um, by a certain algorithm and then signed by my private key. This signed hash is then inserted into the pink or the red part um, and that document is then provided to, to the consumer. As you can see here, um, there is no way of making of, of only signing one page. You cannot sign page for page. Um, the specification is quite clear on that, um, both in 1.7, 2.0, and PADES. Um, you should sign everything, except for the hash itself, of course, because that's not known at the time of signing. Um, so you cannot sign page by page. Um, let's zoom in a bit on the pink part. So um, at minimum, the bolded parts should be embedded into the signature. So what's that? That's the hash. Another word for that is message digest and the signing certificate. Um, ISO 32002, which is the ISO number for PDF 2.0, and PADES, which is a European standard, um, they describe that you should add more. Um, the best practices, as described by those, is that you should embed also the chain certificates, meaning the parent certificates and the root certificate from the CA. Um, you should also include revocation information, that is information whether or not the, um, the certificate, the key, is valid at the time of signing or validation, and the timestamp. The timestamp will, that's, that's a very basic uh, date time object that's been signed by uh, a trusted party as well. That's included in the document to make sure that the document uh, and the signature were valid at the time of signing. So um, PDF does not know the concept of parallel signing, um, unfortunately, but it does know the concept of incremental updates. Um, you can add multiple revisions to a document and you can use revisions to add multiple signatures. For instance, revision two will sign everything that's also in the first revision, meaning also the first signature. Um, and same goes for three with signature two and one. So if you change something in the second revision, if you um, add a word or you remove a word um, in second revision, then the signature for revision two and three will be broken because the hash will be different. Think back to the hashing algorithm explanation that I gave earlier. Um, just the slightest variation in input will give a very, very different output, meaning that the hash will be broken. So these are two signature types. We have a certification signature that's um, an, also known as the author signature. That's the first signature of the document. And then there's approval signatures. Um, this has changed a bit in PDF 2.0, but their uses um, are still in big lines, the same, uh, the same as 1.7. So now we have a very quick workflow. Um, so we have a document that needs to be signed by four people. And Alice already signed this. So the document is then sent to Bob, who needs to sign the document as well. And he enters read and approved by Bob. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, Bob read and approved the document. He signed it with his um, private key and everything is fine and dandy. But then Chuck comes along and Chuck changes the wording that Bob added. So he wrote down changed by Chuck. And as you can see in the left hand panel and uh, indicated by the ribbon uh, up top, um, the signature has been broken. There's a red cross. Um, the panel says there have been changes made to this document. Uh, the signature is invalid. Um, there's a very first indication that something is invalid. This is also something that you can test by code using iText. But luckily, we found Bob's version again, and Carol already signed it. She also read and approved. 
and then the document gets sent to Dave. Dave also signs and approves, and everything is swell again until Chuck comes back and he changes the text that Carol wrote, um, as you can see in the center, changed by Chuck. Um, on the left-hand side, you can now see that every subsequent um, revision, the one by Dave, has also been broken. That's the concept of the serial uh, signatures that I explained earlier. So um, you can easily see where a certain document has been altered. So revision one and two are still valid and proper. So we have a, a quick overview of some um, signing architectures. So um, on the server side, what you usually have is a very specific device called an HSM, a hardware security module. Um, so the application will call this device to sign um, hashes. Uh, this device is um, a high speed, high volume, um, very secure module that is inserted um, into your server rack or hosted by uh, a CA, like GlobalSign, for instance. Um, we have a very similar setup on the client side. If you ever sign something in Adobe, this is how Adobe would do it. And the devices there are very um, specific as well. So you have an ID card reader, um, you have a USB token that you can use um, that the application will talk to and then get a signed hash back from and insert into the PDF file. Uh, deferred signing is something that I uh, also refer to as uh, signing in two steps. So what you do is the first application on the right hand side will prepare the documents and then in a later step, uh, either instantly or um, sometime later, will still send the hash over and then the client or uh, some kind of device will sign that hash and put it back into the PDF file. Um, some use cases for this is that you might not know, not know when you have internet connection, when you have to sign, so you can prepare a document up front. Uh, and when you go to a, a client or something and they don't have internet, you can still sign uh, offline. And uh, lastly, I wanted to give you uh, one use case. So um, CV Trust is one of our customers and partners, and they have a, an application called Smart Certificate where you um, where they try to combat skill fraud um, online. So what they have is they have um, a system set up that signs and issues degrees and certificates, uh, diplomas. Um, and you can easily verify them um, to their database and to their um, certificates. So they have a template designer in which you can easily design a template of a diploma. So John Doe, he's got a diploma for the business school of the world, or for the world. It's signed by the dean and by the president. And then you can issue these to um, your clients and to your students. So Melina, for instance, has, has not been granted the certificate yet, but Bruno has, and so has Camille. Um, so it's a very easy way to, to do this. And this is all done through signatures and blockchain technology, by the way. Um, they have integration into LinkedIn, for instance, um, where you can see, okay, Bruno, he has been awarded or granted two certificates, and those are verified by uh, CP Trust. So he's been awarded something by MIT and by uh, licensed CV trust itself. So it's, it, it integrates very well all. Um, feel free to check this out. So I think we still have five minutes left for questions, Karin. So um, yeah, thank up. you for uh, the explanation already so far. Uh, we indeed have received a few questions. Um, perhaps the first one, does ITEX support PADES? So um, that's, that's an easy one, but maybe I should give a bit more background information. So PADES is um, the PDF Advanced Electronic Signatures. It's a standard by, um, by ETSI, which is a European standard organization for um, telecommunications and te technology. And it's a super set of rules uh, built up on top of uh, PDF 1.7. Um, they define extra rules that you should follow in order to be compliant with signatures. Um, it, we support most of it. So PADES uh, exists, consists out of six parts. The sixth part is um, how you should design your signatures visually. So um, that's not something that we support. We, our customers, that's, that's up to our customers to do. But the first five parts we do support out of the box. Um, and also PADES has been mostly uh, absorbed into PDF 2.0. And given that iText already had support for PADES, um, but also support in uh, also support in um, 
2.0 for um, ITEX 7.0, um, we do support PADAS both in 5 and most definitely in 7. Okay, thanks for this uh, explanation. Um, another question, uh, we still have some time. Uh, Someone is asking whether CRL, OCSP information is included in the certificates. Um, so, Perhaps, can you explain explain the abbreviation? Yeah, yeah sure. So, um, CRL and OCSP, um, those are two methods of of um, checking whether or not a document, uh, a certificate, excuse me, has been revoked. Um, so, assuming that you lose your key, for instance, or you lose your your identity card gets stolen, or you leave a company where you had signing rights. Um, then you need to be able to revoke that key. Otherwise, somebody else could be signing with your key, and that's not that's not allowed. Um, and there's two ways of doing that. So there's a CRL and an OCR, OCSP. OCSP is an easy uh, easy one to explain. So um, that's where you just basically ask a question to the CA. Hey, is this key still valid? They very simply put, they tell you yes or no. And then you can embed that into the signature. It's not embedded in the certificate, um, if I recall correctly, but you embed that at least in the envelope of the signature. And the CRL is a list of revoked certificates. So it's the response is a bit bigger size-wise, um, and you can embed that as well. Um, that's a list that's freely available on any CA's website. So you can download that, cache that for a few minutes, and then put it in your PDF file. OK, um, thanks for answering that question. Um, perhaps uh, another one. Um, someone is asking, what are the main differences between ITEX 5 and 7 when it concerns signatures? Um, so um, I briefly touched upon this um, earlier. So um, ITEX 7 supports PDF 2.0. Uh, 2.0 has absorbed um, PADES and um, some other um, guidelines have, have been uh, added to it. So uh, the main differences there are PDF 2.0 compliance um, and better uh, API support from us because we did redesign the API from 5 to 7. Okay. Okay. Um, perhaps one more question. What happens on a signed PDF after the certificate expires, Michael? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so of course, the, the time dimension of a, of a signature is very important. Um, so there's a few, there's this one thing that you can do to change that, um, to combat that. So what happens is if your signature, if your certificate expires tomorrow and you open the document the day after tomorrow, the signature will appear as being um, invalid because your certificate is not valid anymore. It's expired, it's revoked, um, it cannot be trusted anymore. So what you can do is, and PADES, um, the European standard, um, does have a few provisions for that. So um, PADES part four handles about that. It's long-term validation. And um, simply put, because I could give a presentation on that as well, <laughs> it, it, it works with timestamps. So you add a timestamp to a document, you add all the revocation information to the document. Um, and the timestamp basically um, ties down the certificate to a certain point in time. Um, you say, okay, at this point in time, everything was valid, and then you lock down the document, basically. What happens is the timestamp also has a certificate attached to it, so that will also expire uh, in 10, 20 years, or 20 is a bit too much, but five to 10 years. Um, then you will also have to re-sign the document for that information. You have to make sure that that information was also valid at the time of signing. Um, so PADES okay. part four does have a few um, requirements to combat that. Okay, um, I see we received uh, still a lot of questions, but uh, we're running out of time. So I propose, Michael, that um, uh, we answer all the questions individually with the, the individual people right after the webinar. Um, Sounds so, good. okay, so then I would say thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Michael, thank you for the explanation. Thank you for having um, me. And everyone, if we haven't been able to answer your question, you will uh, receive a, an answer uh, from Michael um, to your question shortly. Thank you very much again for attending.